afternoon and I'm sure that many people have been speaking to you this afternoon so I don't want to take a lot of time as you know diplomats sometimes tend to speak perhaps a little longer than, uh, than they intend but um, I'd like to first of all say that I'm very very uh, impressed with the choice of this afternoon's uh, theme or the conference theme. Um, coming from a country that's multicultural um, and what we consider to be a very open society, um, we have our own challenges in Canada, but I think it's fair to say that we have a model that has worked. Uh, as a country, we're not here to give lessons to others, but to share our best practices and our own experiences. Um, your theme today is very relevant, not only in the Greek context, but anywhere you look in the world. Um, some of the challenges of um, intolerance, uh, xenophobia, um, lack of social inclusion are all themes that are very, very relevant uh, across the world today. Um, the role of young people um, in trying to change the channel, if you will, is doubly important. Um, as Canada's ambassador to Greece, having been here just over two and a half years, and it's my second time, uh, I served here in the, in the 90s, um, it strikes me how, how very much important it is for young people to be much more engaged. Um, when you look at the challenges facing young people today, and unemployment rates, amongst other measures, um, and I look at the talent pool, um, I think that uh, future political leaders uh, are going to come from um, some of you in this room. Um, social change will only come in the end from the bottom up, not the top down to have lasting social change. So I encourage uh, the work that you do to, to motivate and inspire young people and just to have role models that they can, they can, they can look up to. And I guess it brings me to uh, why I'm here today, to introduce perhaps a point of reference role model for some of you. Um, I haven't known uh, Andreas Vladiotis uh, for a long time. His book, I'm sure you've all seen or heard about, um, uh, is, is one that, that piques one's interest when you talk about misfit. Well, I'd like to think that we're all in our own way misfits um, because we all are individuals and we all have our own, our own history and we all have our own baggage in some cases. But Andreas is not only um, a proud Canadian but obviously has very deep uh, roots and he's come all this way to share his own experiences of, of growing up here in Greece but also going to a, to a, a new country and starting over and what that, uh, what that says and what that brings to him as a person. Um, I think, as I said before, that um, young people in Greece need more role models. They need people that inspire and people to, to lead. And uh, Andreas uh, comes from two cultures, two countries, and I think has a lot to say about entrepreneurship, a lot about leadership, a lot about uh, how one can make a real difference uh, by rolling up one's sleeves and, uh, and getting involved. So um, it's always uh, something that gives me great pride when I see Greek Canadians in our very large diaspora of about 300,000 and I see um, persons who come to a new country and uh, in various ways are making a real difference to their communities, uh, to their cities, to their country as a whole. So uh, I'd like to, uh, to now invite Andreas to say a few words and, and hope you will be inspired as I have been inspired since meeting him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. It feels great to be here. It's actually an honor to be back in my birth country, um, even though my intent is to scandalize you just a little bit with my message. Um, so, first of all, let me, uh, let me tell you that because I am a misfit, because I am different, when somebody gives me a half an hour to speak, I don't use the half an hour to speak, I use maybe the first 10 or 15 minutes, and then I really enjoy dialogue, and because this is probably the smallest speech I've given in my life, or the smallest crowd I've spoken to in my life, it'll be easy to have a conversation. So I will speak for a few minutes, and then I'll just break it up, and we can just, uh, you can ask me tough questions. I am the luckiest, I feel like I am the luckiest person on earth because I was born here in the most beautiful country on earth and I was raised over there in the most beautiful society in the world. And let me tell you what I mean by that. I left Greece as a teenager, as a frustrated teenager, for one really bizarre reason. The left turn lane on the roads in Greece. How many of you have experienced lining up on the left turn red light in Greece with your car. And even though you are obeying the law and you're obeying the left turn lane, some other Greek guy who thinks he's much smarter than you comes in front of you 
blocks half the intersection, it waits to turn left, and when the light turns red, it turns green, they go ahead and go. And in fact, sometimes it's another one, and another one, and another one. So the, my, my issue with Greece since I was a kid, which had real implications for me because I was a bit of a different kid, was that Greece is actually not a very free society, it's not a very democratic society. Greeks think they have the best democratic recipe in the world because they think they live in a really free place. They really think that this twisted, naive, perhaps immature definition of democracy, which is, I am free to do anything. It's democracy here. I can do anything I want. And they don't realize that that is a very flawed definition of democracy. Democracy is, I am free to do anything I want as long as it does not impact your freedom. My freedom ends, ends at the doorstep of your freedom. And that's not what happens in this country. Why was that important to me? Well, first of all, I grew up gay in Greece. I was a gay kid 30 years ago in a country that even today would classify as one of the most homophobic Western societies. A lot of Greeks don't think that. I talk to gay Greeks all the time in Athens. I was talking to a couple of uh, gay men here a, week, uh, a couple of days ago. And they believe that they actually live in a fairly progressive society. They think that things are OK here until you ask them if their family know that they're gay. And of course they say, oh my god, no, I would never hurt them, I would never tell them such a thing. Then you ask them if they could imagine a Greek prime minister being gay. And they say, oh my god, nobody would ever vote for a gay person. The straight people wouldn't vote for a gay person. That's just unthinkable. Um, and so that's when you start to see the, their claims break apart. So I was growing up as a gay kid in a society that believed that freedom is limitless. Anybody else's freedom has absolutely no, no stopping point. And even if it impacts my freedom, it's OK. If my homophobic friends wanted to call me names or beat me up, it would be OK, because they're free to do whatever they want. And so that was pretty horrific. I was also growing up different in other ways. I have a little bit of autism or Asperger's in my family. And I've got a kind of a very faint version of that in me. But I was different enough. I was a bit of a you know, slightly autistic kid who, who was a math genius. I was on TV for my extreme math skills. I was on TV for my extreme music skills. And if you think that's a good thing, it was actually a bad thing for me growing up as a kid because I was different. I was really different. And so instead of being, instead of feeling special and feeling admired and feeling like I could go and accomplish something, I was feeling so off the mainstream in Greece that I was being marginalized by everybody. I was the weird kid as opposed to being the smart kid or the achiever kid. What I loved about Canada, and I had the good fortune of being exposed to Canada as a, as a little kid, was that it was the exact opposite society. First of all, in Canada, the definition of democracy is correct. My freedom ends where yours begins. Um, the only thing that binds us as Canadians, the only value that I believe is truly our national value in Canada, is the value of mutual respect. That's the only thing that makes us Canadians. We respect each other. It's not our race, because we're of every race. It's certainly not our language. Because even though we have two official languages, in reality we speak about 100 languages. It's not our religion. It's not anything else at all. It's just the way we think. And we have developed this incredible national value that is mutual respect. I'll respect you, no matter who you are, no matter how you speak, and no matter where you're from. And so for me, that was beautiful. That was an absolute magnet. It was a country that really drew me in. Uh, but ultimately, it's evidence that speaks for itself. I showed up as a misfit kid in a very in a country full of misfits. Because as the ambassador said, we're all misfits. It's just that in Canada, we can be misfits. In Canada, we celebrate our differences. We actually take our differences in my country and we elevate them into national assets. We feel fortunate to have gay leaders in society, autistic leaders in society, black leaders in society. We don't think, we don't think of all, any of these things as charitable work. We don't think of them as, OK, maybe we should accommodate a minority. Or maybe we should be a slightly more balanced society and let a gay person be a leader as well. It's not a favor. It's actually an asset. We realize how much richer we become as a society by having this incredible mosaic perspective and experience. So um, I'll very quickly run you through my story in three minutes or less, and then I'll shut up and let you ask me questions. I um, I stood up there as a as a crazy Greek kid with a big Afro hairdo in the middle of the Canadian prairies in a very conservative little Canadian town, um, and instantly thrived. And the reason I was the reason I was able to thrive is because I stood out. In Canada, standing out is a good thing. In Greece, I was terrified of standing out. But I showed up there, and everybody loved the fact that I was from somewhere else. I spoke with an accent. 
I had all kinds of strange things about me. I was a musician, I was gay, I was creative, I was weird, I had no patience. And every one of those things was an asset. So my life kind of took off unusually quickly in that country. Uh, by the time I was 25 years old, I had already created my first career. I had literally created my own first job. Um, by going to a big staffing agency and convincing them that perhaps they could start exporting Canadian, senior Canadian staff, IT professionals, to the Persian Gulf. Because the Persian Gulf was a very labor-starved, uh, specialized labor-starved part of the world. And um, I happen to know a little more about it because I had come from Greece. So at least I had a bit of an advantage in that respect as well. So I went to the staffing agency and I said, listen, why don't you start exporting Canadian professionals to the Gulf? I'll run that division for you. I know how to get you government money to support you becoming an exporter. And that way I created my first job. And I kept thinking to myself, wow, I guess I am different. Because all of my classmates in my MBA program went on to become bankers and work in large manufacturing companies. And they all got the traditional jobs. I just could not be bothered with anything traditional. So instead, I just went and invented a job, which, as it turns out, paid better than any of the other jobs, gave me a lot more adventure. All of a sudden, I was on airplanes going to Qatar and Kuwait and places like this, developing Canadian business, and then created a bit of an avalanche of career opportunities after that. I became the Canadian IT exporter for a big chunk of my career. Long story short, I grew uh, to the point where one day I became the CEO of a large marketing agency in Canada. And then six years ago, I had another misfit moment, um, which again, I credit to the, the flexibility and the open-mindedness of my society. I realized that I could actually break my corporate career apart and jump into becoming a social entrepreneur, and that there was room for that in society. But Canadian society actually appreciated entrepreneurs that had not just a profit motive, I certainly had a strong profit motive, let me tell you, but in addition to the profit motive, they, I also had a do good motive. I, I had come up with a crazy idea, I had invented the idea of using incentives or rewards to encourage Canadian consumers to be more eco-responsible. So instead of giving people points every time they go grocery shopping, why not give them points only when they shop responsibly, only when they buy the right stuff? Started from the eco space, from environmental responsibility, it very quickly grew into healthy living. So we ended up rewarding millions and millions of Canadians for going to the grocery store and buying healthy food, for going to the gym, for calling into a smoking cessation hotline and hopefully quitting smoking as a result. Um, and on and on and on. We, we discovered all these new niches. Everything we did was truly a world first experiment. We ran all these programs for the last six years across Canada that had not been tried anywhere else in the world, which have all become great claims to fame for our country now. And now with my new business, we're looking to export those beyond Canada, perhaps even to Greece someday. Um, but the, the main theme remained that I was different and I was thriving in an environment that truly harnessed and appreciated difference. It wasn't, Canada does not tolerate difference. It actually harnesses difference. It truly is one of the key assets of our nation. So again, at the, in the spirit of not, uh, not delaying your agenda anymore, I'll wrap up this quickly. But we have some time for tough questions, some very personal questions, which I usually enjoy. So please come at me. Okay, you said you went. Uh, I'm Greek-Canadian too, as I've told you, and I have the same exact feelings. And I grew up in saint jean de Brebeuf in Quebec, a small city. Mm -hmm. How small was this town? I mean, oh, it was small. It was, it's, a, it's the smallest city in Canada to actually house a university. Brandon Mantle, 40,000 people. And how old were you when you went there? 18. 18. And scared. Mm -hmm. so I literally just left, packed up and left with you. I had not really grown up yet. I was just a kid that was leaving high school. And how did you choose Canada? I had been exposed to Canada because my dad, whom Zoe at the back of the room once upon a time knew, was the uh, regional manager for Air Canada's business here. Mm -hmm. So as a kid, I had been exposed to Canada. I had traveled to Canada quite often and had spoken to kids there. I had realized how differently people thought there. And I loved everything about it. You know, I got to tell you, you know, the weather in Canada isn't nearly as pretty as it is here. Uh, the landscape perhaps isn't as pretty. There's so many things about Greece that I find truly, truly magnetizing. But the mentality was really ultimately what made me think, you know, I need to live my life. Somewhere at the back of my book, I talk about the fact that 
had I not made choices about it, had I become, because being a misfit means that in some respects you dare, you do weird things. You don't, you don't as well. perhaps. Uh, but the innovation I applied to myself was to simply pack up and change my world. I could have stayed here. I could have easily stayed here. We, you know, my family had connections here. I would have probably had some kind of a career. But my prediction is that at my current age, I would have been a very unhappily married man, married a woman, mm -hmm. with children, living in a suburb of Athens, and perhaps working as a mathematician at high school, as a math teacher, and being absolutely miserable with the media. And I'm not saying that Greece will be like that forever. In fact, that's why we're having this conversation, because I'm so hopeful that this country will change. But it requires a pretty significant leap in mentality. Right? People have to start understanding that different is useful, different is good. Um, I want just to ask him, what tools must we, as our young leaders, to use uh, in the future to change this society? I'm not an expert, so I'm not an expert in changing an entire society, so it's not an easy question for me to answer. The, the, the one example though, that's very recent and very vivid for me that I'll share with you is when I was chatting with those gay men a couple nights ago here in Athens, and they told me that things were okay, uh, and then we were running through all these examples, you know, but you know, can you come out to your families? Do you have a gay prime minister? Do you have all these things? One of them, including your deputy mayor who was here earlier, said to me that, oh, but the last mayor of Athens was gay. He just wouldn't talk about it. <laughs> right. But you know, that is actually worse than if he wasn't gay. That is actually, you know, people who are different and living in the year 2014 and can't even come out and talk openly about something as fundamental as their sexual orientation, if the guy has to lie in order to be elected, that to me is even worse. Um, he would do his society a much greater service if he said, guess what, I'm gay, or I'm Albanian, or I'm black, or whatever, whatever different in Greece might be. I think it is so irresponsible for someone who has the ability to influence society to not use it. Sorry to be so absolute about it. I remember my blood boiling when he was saying that because I thought it's 2014 for God's sake. You have every every legal and constitutional protection available to you, and here you are afraid to help the country. And you are the mayor of the largest city in the country. More time questions. Let Laura go first. Do you see a role for technology in um, in the celebration of difference? Or a role for my technology? For technology. For technology in general. Well, certainly social media. I, I am noticing that the the tone of conversations about values in Greece. So I do I do participate in social media, and I have a whole bunch of uh, Greek Facebook friends. And I notice that the tone of conversations is certainly getting more intense, and the frequency of conversations around issues like this is accelerating. So. From that perspective, yes. I, uh, I'm not a technology guy, so I can't answer this in any other way. The role of my technology, of my business, as you and I were discussing last night, certainly. I mean, if we, you know, we, Laura and I were talking last night about elections and whether you can actually incent people to participate in the civil discourse by voting. Uh, and this doesn't just apply to Greece. In fact, in Canada, we have a much bigger problem than you do in Greece. Canadians are so apathetic about voting that only half of us now show up at elections. It's not mandatory in Greece as it in Canada as it is in Greece. Um, so yeah, I definitely see a role for incentives and rewards to get the population out to do things. Uh, one area where I think incentives could make an incredible difference in this society is smoking. You know, smoking is like a national curse in Greece. And uh, I think it would be so easy to start rewarding people to take the tiny, tiny little nudge steps towards quitting. Not necessarily rewarding for quitting, but reward them for reading something, for downloading a little app on the phones, or for phoning into a smoker's helpline. The most basic little steps that would start the shift of the population towards healthy behavior. 